Please go ahead. You tell me something. Someone okay. was. Hello, professor. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Tell me. Yeah. Could I sit in the class and get inspired by the research ideas? I'm not yeah. first year PhD student. Yeah, yeah of course. Thank you. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And Chen Yu Charles invite me in the Zoom meeting. Yeah. Excellent. No problem. Welcome here. Thank you. Okay, guys, so let's continue. Hopefully, see you today or, or, or tomorrow, maximum, or not, not tomorrow. Next week, we should be able to be finishing with these stats, okay? You want to see how useful is this statistics, guys, because it's going to be allowing you to, to uh, understand everything we're doing in econometrics, okay? So, do you have questions from previous class? Otherwise, we can, we can move. No questions? Um, the issues that I don't remember, where, where have we stopped last class? Oh, I know. We did probability. Was okay, the... we started probability. So give me one second, guys. Oh, here, here I go. So what, what, uh, what was the, la the last part of what probabilities we did? We did the frequency distribution. Oh, got it. Okay, so good. So let's do the, the frequency distribution. I think we did a table, right? Correct. Okay, so can you tell me the, the, the limits first? The classes? 80 to 85. Yeah. 85, 90. Yeah, okay, so give me one second. 85. This should be a, a parenthesis. And we have 1995. And then uh, the last one. Yeah, 100. Okay. And then we have here the frequency. Remember, guys, the frequency is simply you, you count. Then we have the relative frequency. Then we have the cumulative frequency. And then you have the relative cumulative frequency. Okay. And you're going to see how, why this is so important. Okay, so can you give me the numbers here, please? It was four, three, two, one. Three, two, one. We know that this number 10 represents the sample size. So remember guys that for sure, in order to be sure that we have the correct uh, frequency distribution, this must be 10. Uh, this must be equal to the sample size, correct? Then the relative frequency simply is divided every single number by the total. So I have here 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, and we know that this must be equal to one. The sum must be equal to one. And then the cumulative frequency, you start accumulating the frequency, so it's going to be four, is that four? The next one is going to be four times three, uh, no, four plus three, seven plus two, nine plus one, and of course you arrive also to 10. And finally, guys, what is the relative cumulative frequency? You divide this four again per 10, so it's going to be 0 0.4. 0 0.7, 0 0.9, 1 point zero. Okay, so this is uh, the the frequency distribution table. Now, why why this is important, guys? You're going to see that in a couple of minutes. But let's talk a little about how do we represent this table. Normally, we have two ways of representing this table. We have the, what is called the histogram. Okay, and what is the histogram, guys? Is simply a graph just presenting the frequencies. Okay. So what we have here is we have here the class limits. So basically, I will start at 80, 85, 90, 95, and 100. Correct? And then I have, OK, I have 1, 2, 3, 4 is the maximum. And then I say, from 80 to 85, I have four observations. So basically, I do this. From 85 to 90, I have three observations. From 90 to 95, I have two. And then I have, I have one in here.
Make sense to you? So this is this is what is called the, the histogram. Now, what I can do here, guys, also is another one that is going to be very useful, is what is called the polynomial frequencies. So what is a polygon of frequencies, guys? The, the thing that you need to do is find something that is called a class mark. So if you pay a little attention here, guys, what is a class mark? It's simply the middle point between the class limits. Okay, so what you do is use some, for example, for this one here, the class mark should be 80 plus 85 divided by two. So this should be, uh, what, 82.5, correct? The next class mark is going to be 87.5. The next one is going to be 92.5. The next one is going to be 97.5. And what you do is you simply take the, the, the same point in the, in the top of the graphs, uh, the rectangles. And then what you do simply is you, you simply join all of them. Oopsie. Got it? Now, in order to have a complete polygon of frequencies, guys, the polygon of frequencies always must go to the, um, to the horizontal axis. How do we do that? We create simply an artificial, we create an artificial class, class mark. Got it? If we know the limits, guys, we know that the, the minimum grade is zero, correct? And we know that the maximum grade is 100. Agree with me, guys? So in that case, I, my, I, I don't need to do any artificially class mark. However, if I don't know exactly what is the limit going down or where is the limit going up, what I do is I create artificially another one. You know, not for now. I create another one that has the same magnitude as a previous uh, class. And then I simply create here the, the midpoint and I simply join the point to this point. Here. Got it? And the same, if I don't know in the, uh, what is in the right, I simply create an artificial one here, it should be 105. Of course, not in this case, because there is no more than 100. Create a, the middle and then you simply join that. But in this case that we know exactly where these, these values end. So what we do is, okay, I know that the minimum is going to be zero. So we go from zero to here. And this one here, the maximum is 100. So I know that this is this one. <clears throat> Make sense? It is another graph, guys, and there is another graph that is called the OGIF. And what is the OGIF? <laughs> this works with the cumulative frequencies. <clears throat> I will do, I will use the relative cumulative frequencies. Okay? So we do, we have exactly the same in the X axis class class limits. And what I have here is a relative cumulative frequency. Okay, so I will do the same. I have 80, 85, okay, copy and then we, we can discuss. Okay. So first of all, guys, what is the maximum value that we have in relative cumulative frequency? One. 
one. I cannot have more values than one, okay? Uh, higher values than one. So the, the, you read this in this way, guys. You say, what is the probability, or what is the percentage of observations below 80, according to your table? So you're looking at this, at this part here. You're looking at this part here. So how many, what is the, the, the cumulative, relative, frequent, relative cumulative frequency of observations falling below 80? Zero, right? Guys, everyone agrees with me? Yeah. Zero? Below 85. So this is going to be 0 0.4. Below 90, 0 0.7. Below uh, 95, 0 0.9. I'm sorry, I need to, to do this just to guide myself. And below 100, 1. That's it. Got it. So, what is your OGIF, guys? Simply goes this way and this way. Guys, questions. This is one way of analyzing data, guys, but this is one, one of the best ways of understanding probabilities, as, you, as you're going to see in a couple of minutes. Um, professor, I just have a little bit of trouble understanding your handwriting. What is the graph on the right call, right hand side call again? It's O, like O, give. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you. okay. Okay. And here is relative cumulative frequency. Okay. Makes sense to you guys. Do you understand how to build these ones here? It's, it's very simple. But it's extremely powerful, as you're going to see in a couple of minutes. Okay. Questions? No questions? We're okay? Okay, guys. So now let's go into, into a more formal definition of probabilities, okay? So we continue in, in, the, in the world of probabilities, but now let's talk a little about a couple of things. First of all, when we talk about probabilities, guys, we always need to talk about a, an experiment. So what is an experiment, guys? It's something that you do that you know more or less what are going to be the possible outcomes, do you agree? Okay, but you really don't know what are going to be the, what is going to be the final outcome. It's, it's going to be more or less like a random variable. Make sense? So an experiment is something that you do that you expect to have some outcomes. Okay? Now, the sample space is simply, simply represents all the possible outcomes that you can have from a given, uh, from a given experiment. Okay, I will do one example. Then we have event, events. 
there are simply subsets of the sample space. So let's call this SS and let's call this E event event. Correct. So sample space is all the possible outcomes of a given experiment. Events are subsets of sample spaces. And finally, guys, from here is that we need to define probabilities. Okay. And the properties of probabilities are always this, are always this one here. The probability of A is always between zero and one, correct? We don't have probabilities that are negative. We don't have probabilities that are larger than one by construction. And what is interesting, guys, is that always the probability of A, the probability of A happening versus the probability of A not happening is always going to be equal to one. This A prime is called a complement. Okay. So these are the two properties, guys, that are, are crucial for us. Now, for example, let's do one, one example around here. Flip a coin. I know not a coin, uh, a die. Okay. So this is my experiment. My experiment is simply flip a, flip a die. Now, what is my sample space, guys? What are my possible results if I flip a die? It's going to be one, two, three, four, five, or six. Do you agree? I cannot have any, anything else. That's all. Can we define an event, for example? Let's call event E1 odd results. So this is a definition I want to, to have for, a, for a, an, an, an event. So what should be my, 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 my event? Should be one, three, and five. Do you agree? You can create as many events as you want. You can simply say, you know what? I want event two to be equal to a number six. So what is your event? Simply six. Make sense? Now, what is the probability of event one? So what is the probability that guys, before you, you, you flip a die, what is the probability that, that you're gonna get one, three, or five? The 50%? Exactly, it's going to be, so basically it's going to be number of successes divided by total number of outcomes. Do you agree with me? Agree with me, guys? This one here is called the classical approach of probabilities. So how do we measure probabilities? It's simply the number of excesses divided by number, total number of outcomes. So in my example, this should be simply equal to three divided by six. So the probability of having an odd number simply equals 0 0.5. So how do we define guys E prime, E1 prime in words? Is the complement of E. So in words, it, it is what? Would it be the total number or number of failures over the total number of outcomes? Yes, no, no, but what I mean is remember E1 simply is that the odd results. So what is E1? What is the Oh, that would just be even results. Even results. Exactly that. Okay. So basically, are all other events that are not part of the event of interest. And of course, guys, what is this one here? What is the probability of E1 prime? It's going to be exactly the same, right? In, in this example, it's going to be 0 0.5. And as you can see, guys, the probability of event one plus the probability of not the elements of event, event one is going to be simply equal to
Make sense to everyone? Perfect. Now, what is interesting, guys, is that this classical approach works very good when you know the total number of outcomes. Right? Now, in real life, guys, what is the total number of outcomes, for example, if I'm interested in analyzing the, the returns of IBM that are going to be larger than, than two? Very tricky, right? Because we don't know how many number of successes we have or how many total outcomes we have. We're always going to have a limited space. So what we can say is, you know what, let's analyze the last year data, or let's analyze two years data, or let's analyze 40 years data. But you are always going to be limited to a, to a, a sample. Make sense to you? And so that makes tricky to apply the classical approach. So we need to do something with a classical approach that makes, makes sense. Got it? Do you understand up to now? Now, guys, exists a law in statistics. And, and we apply this law also in, in computer science a lot. The famous law of large numbers. Okay, this is one of the laws, guys, that we are always going to talk. And, and the thing, guys, is you need to know this law. You need to always think about this law when you do when you think about probabilities. So if you go to an interview, if you do your real life research, you're always going to, going to be calling the law of large numbers. So, what is the law of large numbers? So let, let me explain you. In, in a couple of words. Please be sure that you are with me because I will go back to my previous slide. Guys, do you see this table? Our relative distribution table. Now, can you focus your attention on the frequency. Uh, sorry, not on the frequency, the relative frequency. Pay attention to, to that part. Do you remember the characteristics of prob probabilities? Probabili probability of an event is always between one and zero. Take a look. By construction, guys, the relative frequency satisfies this rule. Agree with me? Do you remember what was simply the probability of A plus probability of A prime? Simply means if you sum all the probabilities, what do you get? One. One. Also satisfy that, that, that part there. Now, what makes this table what does what this table presents that you don't believe that this is going to be probability so because imagine if you see this table with 10 observations i tell you guys you know what the probability that uh, you are going to get between 80 and 85 is 40 percent the probability that you're going to get between 95 or 100 in this class is 10 percent how do you feel about, about these probabilities do you trust this probability? pretty good <laughs> no. no well <laughs> yes but it's good in terms of, of the numbers, but how do you feel? How confident do you feel? Uh, not that confident. The sample size seems small. Exactly. That's the issue. So you know what? Uh, you know what? Perhaps you were very lucky and you got one guy that, that was the best of all times and got a 95. But perhaps if you start increasing your sample size, these numbers are going to be changing. Got it? So, but what about if I told you guys, okay, I, I have from here. So my sample size was not 10. My sample size was, imagine, this was 4,000 individuals. This was 3,000 individuals. This was 2,000 individuals. This is 1,000. And so my total sample size is this one here. So what do you think now? That it must so be it's pretty a accurate. More accurate. Yeah, exactly. Do you agree? So what we have done only is what? Increase n. So basically, guys, the law of large numbers tells you that if your sample size goes to the infinite, then my relative frequencies are a very good approximation of probabilities.
Make sense to everyone? Now, the issues that you're doing economics, micro, macro, you need to, to really trust in God because you don't have a lot of observations. You have quarterly observations, perhaps, you have uh, perhaps some monthly observations, but you have a lot of data. In finance, guys, we have God with us. The number of observations we're going to be working, guys, in finance is infinite. We can have millions of observations. I do research with uh, exchanges. And uh, at a given point in time, I had only, it was one month of data, daily data, intra-daily data, so a stick by tick data. It, it had, I was managing more or less around 15 million data points for 20 days, one stock. So for us, low large numbers, of course, it applies, got it? But we are gonna see that, of course, there is a lot of tricks that we're going to be managing that. But do you understand the law of large numbers? It's something I will be stressing and I will always be talking. You know what? We invoke law of large numbers to believe that these probabilities are accurate, okay? Now, why I don't use equal? Because guys, there is always some randomness around here. Okay? Remember, in statistics in econometrics, we're going to be used to, there is always a margin of error, okay? And we're gonna discuss this in, in a couple of minutes. Everyone understand this part here? Okay, good. So let me go to my other slide. So low large numbers, as I mentioned, if the sample size goes to infinite, then my relative frequencies. This are equivalent to my probabilities. Now, guys, please pay attention that my relative frequencies should be uh, sorry. The frequencies should be, as as we said before, mutually exclusive. Remember, we discussed this last class, and exhaustive. Otherwise, that, that even though you have lower large numbers, if you don't satisfy these two conditions, guys, never you're gonna arrive to probabilities, okay? Make sense, guys? Okay, so now let's go, and when we talk about probabilities, guys, the people always talks about the, the joint distribution, the marginal distribution, the, con, um, the contingent, contingent distributions, uh, probabilities, etc. okay? That's extremely easy to understand. Let, let me tell you, let's do one example. Con, we continue with probabilities, okay? We continue with probabilities. But now what I will introduce to you guys is something that's called a contingency table. So what is a contingency table, guys? Let's do one example that is extremely, extremely easy, okay? So let's assume, um, male and female, let's assume uh, perhaps um, economists and management. Okay, so let's call this one E. Uh, management is going to be tricky. Let's call it, let's call it G, okay? Just to make it easy. Assume guys that uh, this is four, this is two, this is three, Yes, something like that. Imagine guys that you have a sample and then you simply interview 10 individuals or perhaps let's assume these are thousands. So just to make it more realistic, 4,000 are male, are economists, 2,000 are managers. In females, 1,000 are economists, 3,000 are managers. Right? So the first thing you need to realize is that how many observations do we have? How many individuals do we have? So we have 10,000 individuals, correct? How many males do we have in my sample? Well, I have 6,000 individuals. So I, I will say this in thousands, okay? How many females do we have in my sample? I have 4,000. How many economists? 5,000. How many managers? 5,000. 
So this is my contingency table, guys, in, term of, in terms of frequencies. Do you agree? Do you understand the table? Yep. Now what we are going to do, guys, is we are going to transform these ones into, by the law of large numbers, because I have thousands, I can more or less assume that this table here represents probabilities. How do I do that? Remember that probabilities are not in terms of frequencies, but are in terms of relative frequencies, correct? So how do you transform this one into relative frequencies? Okay, we'll write here E, G, M, F, so I simply divide every single number by 10. So this is going to be 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, this is going to be 1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.5. Make sense? So now we are in the world of relative frequencies. So, and by the law of large numbers, we can say that these are more or less probabilities. Okay, so remember this is law of large numbers. Uh, professor, I have a quick question. Yes, please go ahead. Um, with the law of large numbers, at what end, what sample size can you like safely use it? You know what? <clears throat> the, the literature says around 250. For me, it's too low. Okay, I've done a lot of simulations, and normally 1,000 is the minimum okay, by simulations. But remember, in, in finance, guys, we don't have issues. What I was telling to you, if you work in economics or, or microeconomics where the data is it's not as frequent as, as, as in finance, then we can have some issues. But we're going to see other tests, okay, that allows us to more or less validate our probabilities. Okay? We are going to have bootstrapping techniques, etc., just to be sure that the probabilities make sense. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. And, and probabilities are crucial, guys, because remember, it's the support for everything we're going to be doing. Okay? In econometrics, you're going to see probabilities is going to be our daily bread. Make sense? Okay, so now names, and I, I, you need to, this is like a, a language class, guys. You need to memorize some, some names. I'm pretty sure you have uh, seen them, heard about them, but you, now you need to, to memorize them. So all the elements are outside. So this, this one here, this one here, this one here, this one here. So for example, how do you, what, what this is, what this 0 0.5 represents? The, the games are very simple. Imagine, guys, that you have these 10,000 individuals, okay? Then you close your eyes, and then you pick one randomly, right? So what is the probability that you selecting one individual randomly, this individual is an economist? What is the probability of that? 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5, exactly. So this guy here indeed represents, this is a probability of randomly selecting one individual that is an economist, right? This is the probability of an individual being a manager. This is the probability of an individual being a, a male. And this is the probability of an individual being a female. Got it? So all these external probabilities are called marginal probabilities.
How do I read this from here? Two things are happening at the same time, do you agree? So this one here is the probability of a, of a male and an economist that is at the same time, same time an economist. This is the probability of a male at the same time being a manager. This one here, I don't know where to put it, is going to be the probability of a female being an economist. And this one here is the probability of a female at the same time being a manager. How do we call these ones here? Joint probabilities. Okay, two things are happening at the same time. Make sense to everyone? Okay, let's do a, a couple of Venn diagrams. Do you remember the Venn diagrams? Help to understand what we're doing. So guys, I will do a Venn diagram. Follow me for a minute and then I, I give you time to, to copy, okay? So we have my, this one here is going to be my complete observations, okay? my, my complete space. Now, what I will do is I want to represent, for example, the, the probability of M and E, okay? So what is a, uh, what I will do is, okay, so these are all my, my males, and these are all my economists. Why do I have an intersection? Because there is an, an element that is M and E, correct? So E, so probability of M, what is the probability of being a, of finding a, a male, 0.6? What is the probability of finding an economist 0.5? Correct, guys? So what is this part here? It's a probability of finding a male that at the same time is an economist. Agree with me or not? And of course, we know that this is the intersection in my, in my point here is going to be equal to 0.4. Okay, copy, then I will, I will ask you for a couple of questions. No, guys, I, I need to understand, I need you to understand this one here. This one here is union, also read as or. Okay, so what is the probability of finding a male or an economist? Got it? So I just care about male, I, I, you know, or an economist. So it, it, it doesn't need to be male and economist. Make sense? So, Graphically, guys, if you take a look to your to your Venn diagram, should be this one here. That should be all this area here, right? 
this is my union, correct guys? Everyone understands that? Guys, if you follow me, then, then I give you time to copy. These concepts are crucial, so I, I will try to move slowly, but listen to me first. Do you agree that the union, oh, sorry, the, the probability of finding a male or an economist is all this yellow part here, correct? So this yellow part here, guys, follow me. Let's do the, the first circle. It's going to be equal to the marginal of M, this part here. You see my mouse moving, right? Plus the other circle, P of B. But do you realize what I've done if I do that? What I need to do in order to have this yellow part, what I need to do? Subtract so 0.4. Exactly. I need to subtract because I'm double counting. I'm double counting this middle part. I need to subtract the probability of M intersection E. Right? Make sense to everyone? Okay, copy. And, and this is the general formula of union. Okay, so what, what are two mutually exclusive events, guys? These events are those that cannot happen at the same time together. For example, and so mutually exclusive event is that they cannot happen at the same time. Right? For example, what is the probability? Well, in, in my example, in real life can, cannot be true, okay? But what is the probability of a, having E Union G. How do I do the, the Venn diagram of this guy? Oh, there is something I, I missed. So all this part here in, in our example, this is going to be, let's do that example. It's going to be 0 0.6. Uh, 0 0.5 minus uh, 0 0.4. So this is equal to 0 0.7, correct? In my example. Now, 0 0.7 is on the yellow part, but remember the Venn diagram, the sum should be equal to one. So what is outside should be equal to what? 0 0.3, Three. Oh. correct? And this one here, guys, is simply probability of not M, intersection probability probability of not e of course what is probability of not m female probability of not e um how do you call it a manager and you can see 0 0.3 here is this part here in such a way that everything that is inside adds to one so that's by construction now take a look if i want to do this union P of E union G. Okay, so if I draw as I did before, P of E, do they have an intersection? E and G, do they have an intersection? No. No. Okay, so can I do 
this stuff like that. Let's see. P of G. Can I do that? So I know that this is equal to 0. Point, uh, P of B equals 0. 0.5, and this is equal to 0. 0.5. So what is that the mistake in this in this graph here? It doesn't Remember, count for the outside the out, space. Yeah, exactly. The outside space doesn't count because I already have a one here. So two ways of doing this one here. What you do is you delete this part here. So delete the, the box. This is your Venn diagram. Or if, if you want, they are different. Or you can do your Venn diagram like that, divided by two. This is my P of E. And this is my P of G. You see, they are OK. But now, in terms of mutual exclusive events, this implies the following, guys. These two mutual exclusive events are true if the probability of them, the joint probability of them, guys, equals what? Empty. What means that the probability, the union of probabilities, uh, is simply equal to the sum of marginals. So the definition of, of a mutual exclusive event, guys, is this one here. That the joint is empty. They don't intersect. Meaning that if this happens, this cannot happen. In real life, guys, in real life, you can have an economist that is at the same time a manager. Do you agree? But in this example, no. And this is the definition of mutual exclusive event. Ready? Okay. So we have marginal probabilities, we have joint probabilities, we have a mutual exclusive event, and then we have something that's called a conditional probability. Now, in order to understand conditional probabilities, guys, just think this in a sequence. Okay, first happens, so the, the definition of a pro, of conditional probability simply, the probability, let's assume, of A given B in general. So this implies the following, guys. Given that you have observed that you get V, what is the probability that this guy is going to be A? Okay, perhaps let me, let me write this with the with example that we're using inside. So imagine, guys, that you randomly select someone from this group, okay? You don't see, randomly select, and then you realize that this is a female. Make sense? Do you understand what I'm doing? Close your eyes, select from these 10,000 people one person, and this person, open your eyes, is a female, right? So the next question is, now knowing that this person is a female, what is the probability that this female is an economist? So this is a conditional probability. It's a sequence of events. Now, this is going to be equal, guys, to probability of E intersection F divided by the probability of F. From here, guys, have you done some Bayesian analysis today? Uh, you, have you done Bayesian analysis? Bayesian econometrics, have you done that? Artificial intelligence uses a lot of uh, Bayesian updating, okay? But this is the, the basics of that. Now, if we put numbers in our, in our equation, what is the probability of E intersection F? E intersection F is 0 0.1. And probability of F is 0 0.5. So what is that? 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.5, 20%. Uh, professor, isn't the probability of F uh, 0.4? Uh, Oopsie, you're right. Completely right. So it is 0.1 divided by 0.4, 25. Do you understand this 25%? Do you understand what is the meaning of this 25%, guys? 
So this is the general formula. Do you understand what this 25% means? Uh, yes, it's so P of uh, the, so the numerator is the, basically the frequency, the relative frequency of uh, a female economist or an economist who is female and then mm -hmm. the denominator is the total, the relative frequency of the total number of females. Exactly. So this 25% simply means that if in the first round you selected a female, you have 20% 20, 20 chance that this female is going to be an economist. Make sense? That's the wording. Makes sense to you guys. So we're going to be using all these probabilities later, but makes sense to you. Okay. Copy one minute and then we'll move. continue and, and and this is crucial for those of you that have done um, econometrics before the statistical independence this is simply the probability of one event happening does not influence the probability of other event happening Okay, the probability of one event happening does not influence the probability of other event happening. This guys implies mathematically that the joint is simply equal to the product of marginals. So this is the definition of a statistical independence guys. Okay. Now, what happens with a conditional? Well, my conditional is going to be A given B is going to be a probability of A times probability of B divided by probability of B, correct? However, if A and B are independent, This one here can be, uh, sorry, sorry, my mistake. The general formula is this one here. Yeah, let me clean this part here. The general formula is this one here. If they're independent, the joint is simply equal to the marginal divided by B, what do you get? So when two events are independent, the conditional equals to the marginal or the numerator. And, and this concept is crucial guys for econometrics. So I, I need to do a couple of examples.
Okay, can you follow me? One minute to copy. Okay, let's do the following experiment, guys. And I will show you one technique that is extremely useful and very easy to, to do. So imagine, guys, that we have a box with five balls, three red and two white. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to simply pick up two balls randomly and we're not going to replace them. So I take one, see the color, count the color, and move the ball outside the box. Okay, do you understand the game? Okay, so let's do something that's called a tree diagram. So if I pick randomly one ball, okay, so this ball can be red or can be white, correct? So what is the probability of having a red in the first round? A red is going to be number of red, number of successes divided by number of, of everything. So it's going to be three over five. Guys, everyone is with me? Three yeah. over five. And what is the probability of having uh, white is going to be 2 over 5. Okay, good. Now, the second round. I also can have a red or I can have a white, given that the first is red. I can have a red or I can have a white. Okay. Now, always the last one here, this one is going to be always the, the joint. So this is going to be the probability of R, R and R. This is the probability of R and W. This is the probability of W and R. And this is the probability of uh, W and W. How do we call this? So these ones here are called marginals, as you can see. Marginal probabilities. These ones here are my joint probabilities. What do you think are, are, are this part here? What do we have here? Our conditional probabilities, guys. Okay. So this one here, how do we call this one here? I, I will do this perhaps a little high. This is going to be probability of what I know at this point. At this point, what I know. My first ball was what? Red, correct? This one. So what is the probability that the second one is going to be red? This one here is going to be, what is the probability of having a white given that the first one is red? This one here is going to be the probability of red given that the first one was white. What is the probability of having white given that I have another one? Everyone understands that? Yep. Okay. So you tell me, it's without replacement. How many balls do I have here in the in the second round? I have only four balls, correct? If I got a red, how many reds do I have in the in the box? Two. Make sense to you? Okay. So what is the probability that given that the first one was red, the second one is going to be red? Should be what? Fifty percent. Yes. Two over four. Now, the probability of white and red is also two over four. The probability of red and white is one. Now, I, 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 from the balls, I have only one, I took one white out. So what is the probability that, given that the first one was white, is gonna be red? Three over four. Exactly. Guys, everyone is following me here? Good, and what is the probability of having the second one white? is going to be simply one over four. In order for you to understand that we are correct, guys, every branch should add up to one. So three, five, three-fifths over two-fifths is one. 
If you take a look to this part here, two fourth over two uh, plus two fourths equals one. Three fourths over plus one fourth equals one. So you need to be sure that everyone adds up to one. So how do I compute P of R R? Remember, in general, guys, remember the probability of A given B equals probability of A intersection D times probability of B. All right. So from here, probability of A intersection D equals the conditional times the marginal. It's simply uh, an application of, of the formula, guys. So this one here is going to be equal to three over five that multiplies two fourth. This is going to be um, three over five that multiplies uh, exactly two fourths. This is two over five that multiplies three over four. Uh, and this is equal to two over five that multiplies uh, that multiplies uh, one over four. So this is equal to and If you sum all of these probabilities, guys, you also add up to one. Make sense? So with this table, guys, you can answer everything. So for example, I ask you, guys, what is the probability of having a one white and one red from this experiment? Six over 20, right? Okay, so you can answer everything. What is the probability of having a white given that the first one was white? 10%. Uh, yeah, one over four. No, the, the white given white. So remember, I'm, I'm asking about this part here. What is the probability of having a white given that the first one was white? One fourth, 25%. Right. All right. Now, what is the probability of having two whites? That's your, your, your answer, 10%. Correct? You understand the difference, no? What is the difference of having two whites versus the difference of having a white versus the difference of having a white given that the first one was white? So there are three different concepts, guys. Do you see that? P of W is the probability of having a white. P of WW uh, is the probability of having a white given that the first one was white, this one here. And this one here is the probability of having two white at the end of my, my experiment. Got it? Okay. Uh, I don't mean to slow you down, but no, 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 no. I, I, did not, okay. I did not get the difference between the two. Yes, let's, let's take a look to this one here. This one here is sequential. What we read is the following. What is the probability of having this white here, the second white, given that the first one was white? This is my condition. Got it? What is this one here? This is the probability of having the first white and the second white. Got it? This already happened. So this one is a sequence. I want to see what is going to be the next one given that the first one was was why this one here is already happened. Got it? So, so when you say that, what is the probability of uh, picking white again when you've already picked white? Um, when you use the term given, that means that it was our the probability was dependent on the previous pick result. Versus, exactly. Okay. Exactly, that's the sequence. That's the sequential piece is this one here, the conditional probability. Okay, okay, guys, you do one example. And now, what I will do, do the same example. So let's do this example number one. Professor, you do the yes, go ahead. I just have a question about that last example. Yep. Um, so you mentioned that the probability of getting one red and one white would be six over 20. 
But since there's two possible outcomes there, would you have to add? Uh -huh. well, that's a fantastic question. If you, for, if you are just inter if you are interested about the, the, the order, no. If you told me, I want to know the first one's white and the second one's red, okay, it's six over 20. But if you're interested in general, you know, what is the, the if you have one red and one, and one white, in that case, you need to sum these two numbers. Okay? Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. That's a, a very good question because we're going to apply that concept in, in a minute. Now, guys, so you as a matter of practice, do the following. Now, remember, this is without replacement. The only thing that I will change here is with replacement. <coughs> <coughs> With replacement, okay. So what, what is the idea of oh, with replacement, guys? You take one ball, take a look to the color, move the ball again to the box. Got it? So you're always going to have um, five balls. Uh, okay, and again with replacement, two balls. Can you please create uh, the tree diagram and let me know what is the probability? What is the probability? And what is the probability? If you can answer, do the tree diagram and then answer, answer this one here. Professor, really quickly, um, the ball that we're pull, pull, pulling out is going to be the same ball that we're putting back into the, the box. Yeah, so remember, okay. imagine that the, 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 you, you don't see the balls, huh? remember, that's the trick, so it's random. You put your hand in the box, close your eyes, pick one. Take a look to the color, take a note to the color, return the ball to the box. And then you shuffle again and then you take randomly and all that. Got it, thank you. Okay, perfect.
Okay, one more minute, guys, and then we'll solve it. Ready? So the first part is the same, right? The probability of R is going to be a three over five. The probability of W is going to be two over five. Right, guys? Now, what happens here? If you return the ball, so we continue having three and, and two, what is the probability of R given R? Three over five. Exactly. So this becomes, guys, P of R, 3 over 5. So how do we call this one here? Statistical independence. The probability of having R at the beginning does not influence the probability of having R in the second row. Make sense? In this case, no. In this case, the probability of R given R dependent, was dependent on the first one being R, right? In this case, no, I don't care. If, if it, this was R, my probability doesn't change. The same here, this is going to be two fifths. And the same here, this is going to be R is going to be three over five. And this is going to be two over five, correct? Guys, make sense? And then finally, this one here, of course, is going to be, I will just write the numbers. It's going to be 339, 925, 625, 625, and 425. Uh, if I've done this correctly, we should add up to one. Uh, 15, yes, 25, 25. Make sense? Now, okay, copy this one here. And if you have questions, please ask me now because I, I, will, I will do some trick here. Are you all with me, guys? Clear? Okay, now, take a, take a look to the following example. Now assume, guys, that instead of having three balls and, and uh, three red and two whites, I will have, please, please pay attention what I'm, what I'm doing, then you copy. I will have 3,000 red, and I will have 2,000 uh, white. Okay, so now take a look. This one here, what is the probability of having a red? It's going to be simply 3,000 divided by 5,000. Agree? And this one here is going to be 2,000 divided by 5,000. Take a look to what happens. This one here is gonna change now. With, uh, with the orange, this is going to be equal to one. It's not two over four anymore. So if I have one red, I will have, and I want another red, it's going to be 2,999 divided by 4,999, correct? 
agree with me, guys? Now, if you compare, and uh, we just do this one here, compare this one here with this one here. How are they? So let's call this alpha and let's call this beta. How they are? Just use your calculator. So alpha is 3,000 over 5,000. So it equals 0 0.6, correct? And if you divide 2,999 divided by 4,999, you get 0 0.5999, one nine, etc. So basically, these two numbers are equal. Make sense to you? So guys, here comes what is interesting for us. The larger the sample size, okay? The larger the, the sample size, the more sure you can be that a statistical independence works. Even though you know that the process is not a statistically independent, but if you know that you have a large sample, you know that they behave as if they are statistically independent. Make sense to you? Guys, make sense to you? Because one of the, the issues, guys, is when we do econometrics, we always assume, oh, that the errors are IID, are independent and statistically ident identically distributed. Independent, okay? And the people is going to complain, is going to tell you, well, how do you know that they are independent? Well, because I have thousands of data points. And because I have thousands of data points, even though the process per se is statistically dependent, because the, the large sample size, we can assume with a lot of certainty that the process behaves as one independent, statistically independent. Make sense to you? Guys, make sense to you? Yes. Okay, good. So I think that also this one here is, is related to the law of large numbers, of course. The larger your sample size, guys, makes two processes become, oh, two events to look like, look as if they are independent, even though they are not. Okay? Because they are so close to each other that you don't distinguish between them. You, how do you distinguish 0 0.6 versus 0 0.599999? It's almost nothing. Okay? So every time that we do a statistical independence, I will tell you, hey guys, let's assume statistical independence. If you have doubts that this holds, because you believe that there is dependence, just think about the number of observations we're working with. If we have, a, if we have only 15 observations, guys, then you're in trouble. Make sense? Because you are in the first example. But if you have 2,000 observations, as the ones we're going to have, or you have 500 observations, you don't feel the difference. Got it? And so we are going to be sure that what we are doing makes sense. Because that's what, at the end of the day, guys, we need to be sure that what we do is correct. That's, that's all this class. Make sense, everyone? Questions? No questions? No. Okay. So let's go now, guys, into probability distributions, okay? So let's start something that's called probability distributions. And I, I always like to start this one here, guys, defining what is a random variable. Okay. So what is a random variable, guys? Well, it's a variable. Variable. You know all the outcomes? All the potential outcomes? But you don't know the final outcome until you finish the experiment. Okay, the final outcome only when you finish experiment. Make sense to you? Now, for example, 
flip a coin twice. X. Two times or twice. Okay, so my random variable is flipping a coin twice. So what are the possible results? I can have head heads or tails and tails. The next one, heads I can or have tails. heads and heads, perhaps no. tail and heads and tails and tails. Do you agree? These are all my possible results. So I know them beforehand. I, I know before doing my experiment, <clears throat> I know this. These are my possible results. But when I know the final result, when do I know that, guys? Not until doing it. Exactly. Once I do it, then I, I know what is the final outcome. So this is a random variable, x. <clears throat> OK? <clears throat> Okay, before going to, before continuing with this example, <clears throat> there are two types of random variables, guys. And uh, these are important because they define types of probabilities. One of them <clears throat> is discrete random variables. Okay, very easy to understand. Just take an interval. And if you have holes in between observations, you are looking in, in a random variable. For example, I'm just interested about the years of each of you. Years. I, I don't care number of months, days, hours, etc. I just want to know the, the years. What years do you have? How old are you? Okay, in that case, I will have someone is going to be 23, someone is going to be 31, someone's going to be 30, etc. But in between observations, we have holes. Do you agree? There is nothing in between 20 and 21. Nothing. So we have a discrete random variable. Now, discrete random variables, guys, give or create discrete probability distributions. Okay, some examples, the binomial distribution, the geometric distribution, and the hypergeometric distribution. I will not do all these all these ones here. Uh, the Poisson distribution that is extremely important. We're going to work with Poisson later, but I, I, we don't have time to do this quickly. And and of course, if we have discrete, we have continuous distributions. Continuous random variables. Simply, you take a, an interval. And any possible value in this interval is possible. For example, returns, guys. Okay, in finance, returns. You can have a 2% return, yes. You can have a 2.0001% return, yes. You can have a minus 1.5 return, yes. So everything in the interval is possible. So we have a continuous random variable. And continuous random variables, of course, uses continuous uh, probability distributions. Okay, the ones that I will present very quickly later, because we're gonna use them a lot. The normal distribution, uh, T the student. And in class, we're gonna talk about the F distribution, the chi-square distribution, etc. Okay, so we're gonna do, uh, now in, in, in this part of the review, we're going to do normal and T and the F and chi-square, we're going to do them later in, in part of the class. Okay, guys, questions up to now. It's clear. 
there's a lot of material guys and remember that I, the first test is going to be just this stuff is this part here is going to be the background if you if someone asks with you about the statistics and econometrics you know this part very well you're going to be in a different position because most of the people guys that believe they know econometrics when you ask the basics of econometrics I said statistics they are completely lost okay and these are fundamentals of what we're going to be developing in econometrics so you need to know this stuff it's very simple you know that if you follow the track of thinking my way of thinking is going to be extremely simple for you guys just to understand make sense of all this stuff that i'm pretty sure you have seen in the past and right you have seen this these issues correct yep yes perfect okay guys so remember when we have a um, a random variable we need to make to, to to explain the random variable you remember when we have data what do we do central tendency and dispersion always central tendency and dispersion they say the mean and the, and the standard deviation correct those are the, the measures of of understanding my data i want to see how focalized is my data and how dispersed is my data okay now when we talk about a probability distribution guys we're going to talk the mean is going to be called expected value and the standard deviation is going to be standard deviation okay so let's do one example. You, you want to understand how to compute the, the mean. And this applies to all types of distributions that are discrete. The continuous, we use simply integrals, or we use R or MATLAB or image. So for example, guys, let's continue with my flip a coin. So flip a coin twice. OK. Now, and my x, my random variable, is going to be a number of cats. Okay, so I just want to to see my number of cats. This is my my experiment. Okay, so my possible results are H T H H T H T H and T T. Correct. So X number of heads i have here one i have here two i have here one and i have here zero correct i will simply reorganize this one here so i have zero one or two so these are all the possible outcomes of, of heads i can have zero heads i can have one head and i can have two heads So, what is the probability of X? Hmm. Oops, I need to delete this for a minute. Ah, yeah, I need to define something, guys. That is, what is the probability distribution? I mean, it doesn't matter. So, what is the probability of X? What is the probability of having one, one head? It's one divided by four, right? They agree or not, guys? So this one here, one, two, three, four. So one, how many successes I have is one over four, CO25. Having two heads, CO25. So having another head, CO25 and CO25. Do you agree, guys? I have 25% of having head and tail. I have 25% of having head and head, 25%, etc. Okay. Right? Now, if I Condense, and this is related to the question of one of your friends. Well, this one here is exactly the same as this one here. It's one, one, one head. I don't care if it's head and tail or tail and head. So what I do is zero, one, and two, and I collapse. So this is going to be. Uh, sorry, this is 0 0.25. One is going to be 0 0.25 plus 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and this is going to be 0 0.25. Correct, guys? Do it make sense to you? Yeah. So that's why if no. you're going, why not? Uh, Are you don't understand? No, I'm just not following your math. Yeah. That's all. Take a look. Uh, if you could take a look. So um, now, first of all, when you when you flip a coin, these are two independent events, statistically independent events. Do you agree? Agree with me or not? Because if I flip a coin, I have a head. It has nothing to do with the next round. It can be head or tail. Got it? So if you do a, a small tree, let's do a small tree. So this implies the following. I have head or tail. So probability of, of head 
the first one is 0 0.5 and the probability of t equals 0 0.5 correct now in the second round oh sorry ht and, and this one is also ht so here what is the probability of head given that the first one was head do you have an influence here guys so having head influences the result in, in the next round no no so they are independent so this is going to be zero zero five zero five zero five makes sense to you because they are completely independent and unless there is something wrong with a with a coin this is what should happen you have a head and the probability of having another head is 0 0.5 you can have a head or a tail it doesn't matter so they're independent because this is basically statistical independence agree and so how do you compute the conditional the probability of having h and h is simply 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 and this is equal to 0 0.25 this number here no 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 this is h and h sorry this number here h and t 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 0 0.25 etc make sense to you guys so this is the, the conditional of p h and t p t and h and p t and t so everyone is 0 0.25 And then basically what we're doing is we're joining, we're joining these two here. Make sense guys? Do you understand where these numbers come from now? Guys? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Perfect. Okay, so now this one here, guys, the random variable and the probability associated to it, so x and p of x, this is what is called the probability distribution. Okay, so what is the probability distribution, guys? It's simply the random variable and its associated probability distribution. That's it. That's what we call a probability distribution random variable and the probability associated to them. Okay? Understand that when we talk about probability distribution, simply random variable probabilities, that's all. Now, two measures that I let's, let's run. One of them is expected value. And the expected value guys, let's call expected value of X is simply going to be sum of PI XI from i equals one to n. I will explain this in a minute. And, uh, and the variance is simply going to be sigma square of x. That's the way we, we know, know this one here. And it's going to be simply sum of x i. And, and also this one here, sometimes we call it mu. I will use mu, the Greek, minus mu square <coughs> times pi. Okay, so how do I do this? I, I will do this very quickly with you guys to compute this one here. So my expected value for this example is simply multiply this number times this number, this number times this number, and then you sum. So this is going to be zero times 0 0.25 plus one times 0 0.5 plus two times 0 0.25. Okay guys, this is the formula. 
simply multiply every possible random every possible value of the random variable times its probabilities, and then you get the expected value. So this is going to be zero, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So my expected value, guys, is equal to one half. Or do you agree? Now, what is my variance? My variance, let's apply the formula, is going to be zero minus one, so mu is one or x bar if you want, square times 0 0.25 plus one minus one square times 0 0.5 plus two minus one square times 0 0.25. Agree with me? If you can help me compute it, let me compute this. So the first one is going to be 25. So it's going to be 0 0.25. The second one is zero, and the third one is um, one squared 25. So the variance is equal to 0 0.5. Can you please verify that? And of course, the standard deviation is the positive part of 0 0.5 squared. Okay. So in this the expected but the average guys, the average value that we expect is to have one head. So that's why in if you want to bet guys, what do you bet? Two heads, two tails, or one head? Why guys? Which one is um which one is, is the number that you need to bet? One head. One head. Because uh, the likelihood that you're going to, to win is higher, 50% versus having two heads or two tails. Make sense? Make sense to everyone? Okay, yeah. so we are going to stop here. Uh, just as a matter of practice, guys, for you for next week, okay? just to get grip of all this stuff. Imagine that you have two dice, okay? Um, and then you simply flip them. Tell me what is the optimal number? What is the, the, the combination of numbers that you're going to bet? Okay, so remember you, you flip two dice and then you can have two, you can have three, you can have four, five, and the maximum is from two to 12, right? Make sense? So what I want you to tell me, and you can do this in, in Excel, try to do this in Excel, what I want from you is to tell me, first of all, which, which is the number that you're going to bet based on this, what is the probability? So I want you to create a, the, the probability distribution. And once you create your probability distribution, I want you to tell me what is the expected value of this, of this example and what is the variance and, and the standard deviation of this example, of your example. Make sense to you? Do you understand the, the, the question? Okay, and then this is going to be a good example for you to practice and, and remember how these things are here. Okay, guys, so I think next week we finish the statistics. And let's say in a couple of weeks we have the first quiz that is going to be just related to statistics. Okay? Let's set a, a couple of weeks. If you, if you need more time, we give you one additional week because I want you to really understand and, and manage these concepts. Questions, guys? Uh, Professor, can I speak with you after class? Yes, Kevin, of course. Okay, guys. So we we'll stop here and, and we we'll see you next week. Um, statistics is going to be, I'm, I'm happy. We're moving really good. I, I, need, you, you, I need your input, guys. Uh, so if we are running too fast, remember, this is a, simply a, a refresh. So hopefully you can read, take a look again. And if you have questions, specific questions next week, we can we can review them, okay? Remember, take this also, guys, like a preparation for a job, really, seriously. I, I've, done, I've done interviews a lot of times, Morgan and GP Morgan, and 
I do simple questions like this and I destroy the <laughs> Got it? So just be prepared. Okay, guys. So see you in, in a week and, and talk soon. Okay, so I just stay with Kevin. Professor, uh, yes, you want us ahead. to choose just one number between the, what is it, the 2 and 12 uh, range? Yes. So if you want to bet with me, okay, which number you're going to put your money on? Okay. Right. And then, of course, just as a matter of practice, you can do this in Excel also. Compute the expected value. So what is the expected value of this game and what is the variance of this game? Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay, guys. Talk soon. All right. Thank you, Professor. Thank, thank you. you, guys. Take care. The professor? Yes. Uh, so I just had one more question. Uh, when would we have access to the Blackboard uh, portal for the recordings and stuff? Uh, I don't know. I will, I will ask. Okay? I will ask for that. Don't, don't worry about that. I don't know. I need to ask because full of this is complicated in my life. But I, I will ask for that for sure, guys. Okay, sure. Thank you. Okay, everything goes to my cloud and the cloud they, they manage. I need to ask them. I will do that. Okay, okay, sure.